Um, he Heather, thank you for joining us from New York, from the Big Apple. Thank you. This is a lot of. This is going to be a lot of fun. A first Skype session. All right. So yeah, Heather, let walk us walk us through all this. Manhattan Institute is a really cool um, think tank. It's constantly been rated in the top think tanks. How long have you been involved with them? Probably since about '92. I started writing for their quarterly magazine called City Journal, and um, since then I've been a regular contributor to their publication and and uh, have enjoyed living through the transformation of New York City in its glory years in 1990 with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. The Manhattan Institute played a big role in serving as kind of a think tank for his ideas. So that was that was an exciting time. Rudy Giuliani's main think tank ideas that really resonated with New York and with you. I'm sorry, did you say which, which were some of the ideas that work? Well, certainly the notion that crime is in fact not a permanent condition of American cities, that policing, contrary to what was then received wisdom, can be very effective in bringing public safety to high crime neighborhoods. And that one important factor of successful policing is paying attention to public disorder, something that has been long lost in San Francisco civic culture. Uh, but the police started listening to the demands that come constantly from law abiding residents of, of high crime neighborhoods to get the drug dealers off the corners, to get the kids that are hanging out in hundreds fighting on the corners uh, away so that elderly ladies can get to the store without worrying about getting caught in a fight. And uh, certainly the vagrancy and homeless problems uh, were for once paid attention to. Turnstile jumping was no longer ignored. And so slowly but surely the sense of anarchy and threat that had taken over New York City in the early 1990s lifted and you got an extraordinary economic transformation of the city that was driven by the fact that our crime rates started plummeting. So, so the idea of crime not being a necessity in society, something that can be overturned with things like education, better parenting, um, better communities, what was kind of your discovery about that? Well, there's two narratives. Uh, you know, the, the liberal narrative about crime was that you couldn't solve it without eradicating its alleged root causes, uh, which were traditionally said to be income inequality, poverty, and racism. And so the solution to high crime was a lot more government spending and redistribution and uh, social programs. The conservative analysis of crime, one that I agree with, is that it grows overwhelmingly out of family breakdown. When you have a culture like you have in many inner cities now where there's virtually no expectation that young boys uh, should marry the mother of the children that they are uh, spreading around the neighborhood, they don't have young boys don't have any incentive to develop the bourgeois values that would make them attractive mates. Marriage civilizes men. Uh, not always, obviously, but on average, it is an extraordinarily important cultural value. Well, the interesting thing about New York City in the 1990s is neither the liberal nor the conservative root causes of crime changed very much. Uh, the traditional liberal analysis of neighborhoods of we didn't get a lot more uh, social spending there. There wasn't a huge reduction in income inequality, nor did we see a drop in out of wedlock child rearing in neighborhoods like Central Harlem or Central Brooklyn or the South Bronx. What changed was the quality of policing. It became data driven accountable and proactive. 
Uh, and that was the discovery uh, that fulfilled a promise that Mayor Rudolph Giuliani and his first police commissioner, William Bratton, made to the city that through data-driven accountable policing, they would finally bring the public safety to high crime neighborhoods that they have an absolute right to expect. And I will say what yeah. you said, see, another, another conventional explanation is that you cannot lower crime until you have an economic turnaround. That's the William Julius Wilson explanation uh, for high crime neighborhoods is the jobs all left and therefore uh, social breakdown accelerated and crime accelerated. In fact, in many cases, it's the reverse causation that is important. You cannot have an economic revival in high crime neighborhoods when crime is as high as it can be. Employers, only the most marginal employers are going to move into a neighborhood when they have to worry that their employees are gonna get mugged coming to work in the morning or leaving work at night. So what we saw in New York was by driving crime down, that is what spurred the economic revival on 125th Street in Harlem, uh, in parts of Brooklyn that now have been massively gentrified because people could go to restaurants at night without fear of getting mugged and people could take their children to school without fear that they would get shot. Yeah. What were some of those data-driven processes that we looked at to figure out uh, how to reduce crime, uh, what was going on? Well, New York, the New York Police Department developed, I think, the most groundbreaking government revolution of the last quarter century. It's come to be known as CompStat, and this is a process that has been picked up in other areas of governments across the country. Uh, but it began with weekly meetings at the police headquarters where the top brass that worked downtown in the, in the police headquarters would on a weekly basis call in a precinct commander, a district commander, I don't know, you know, these are called different things, but the, the, the guy who had geographic uh, responsibility for a particular part of New York City. And the precinct commander would be called downtown and subjected to an extraordinarily high tension, high powered meeting where the top brass would grill him about crime patterns on his watch. They had, would have spent the previous week or month analyzing, going out to the precinct, doing their own sort of shoe leather reporting on what was going on in those precincts, pouring over the precinct's crime data, they call in the commander and grill him about his knowledge of patterns, emerging crime patterns, and whether he had a strategy for quelling if there'd been an outbreak, say, of burglaries on a particular thoroughfare or robberies of elderly women on a particular street. This was this expectation that the commander was responsible for crime had never been lodged against a, a precinct commanders before. And these initial ComStat meetings were so high powered and high tension that sometimes chairs were thrown, people were known to throw up before they got on the hot seat uh, because the pressure on them was so unrelenting to finally bring the homicide rate down in, 2000, in 1990 New York's homicide numbers reached 2,245. And the sense of urgency that the New York Police Department had under Mayor Ruloff Giuliani and, and Bratton to bring the crime rate down was enormous. And the CompStat process, which continues to this day and is a, a, a system for sharing information the, the city, the department started gathering data on first a daily basis about crime, then on an hourly basis and a minute by minute basis using increasingly sophisticated computer techniques to analyze the patterns of crime and try to figure out what strategies were working. 
This brought the data revolution into the NYPD, made it agile, uh, and again, data-driven. And this type of accountability and information sharing process has been picked up in other government agencies to hold uh, managers responsible and, and make sure that the agency is using as much up-to-date information uh, to develop and, and follow up on its strategies as it possibly can. And keeping neighborhoods safe that way. And we were talking about this when we were at, at Berkeley together. I had mentioned to you Palantir's software with data fusion technology. And that seems like it's another step in the future, taking in all of the new social media information, all of the phone records, all of that kind of data that can predict crime um, and then be at the right place at the right time to prevent um, homicide. That, that, that seems to be so important for kids, safety, um, all that kind of stuff for securing um, our future. Um, did, did that seems to be the direction of which we're going, you think? Well, absolutely. I mean, Palantir and other so-called predictive policing uh, methodologies are really just a beefed up version of Comstat, because Comstat was doing the same thing. It would, you know, the meetings they throw on the PowerPoint screen uh, the data points of where crime is happening and try to bring local knowledge to bear on where it's likely to break out next. The challenge is, of course, that these predictive policing technologies have been challenged on the ground that they somehow reproduce what I think is phantom uh, police racism by showing yet again that the overwhelming majority of violent street crime is committed in minority neighborhoods. The false narrative that we've been living with for the past five, five years or really 30 years about policing is that it is pervaded with systemic and lethal bias. If that's the case, if somehow every police officer through some mysterious process gets infected by bias on his job, you would think that the solution would be to use computer algorithms that are presumably free of this scourge of, of implicit bias. Again, I do not acknowledge that that is a problem, but if it were a problem, uh, a impartial computer algorithm should be the solution, except it turns out when you have computers analyzing crime data and making predictions about where it's going to happen next, they reach the identical conclusions as human analysts, uh, which is that the vast majority of victimization is in occurring in minority neighborhoods, and that's because the vast majority of criminal commission is also occurring there. This kind of leads us to talking about um, about behavior and um, the differences in um, behavior. You actually, we were chatting about this a little bit right before we went live, but um, it is so true that um, kids that are born out of wedlock um, typically have higher rates of crime. Um, what, what have you learned about studying this? Um, what are these other indicators about um, behavioral differences uh, for what happens to a kid when they're really young and the seeds planted in their head and then their environment and everything that's um, interacting with them through their adulthood and what how they end up either being in crime or not being in crime what have you learned about that well the social science data is pretty unequivocal that children raised in single parent homes are many times more likely to drop out of school to fail in school to get involved in juvenile delinquency, to have children as teens if, if they're females. Uh, and that's not to say, I mean, this is such a touchy subject, it should not be because our concern should be looking at the data and finding out what kids need. Uh, but it's not to say that there are not countless heroic single mothers who are working overtime to raise law-abiding children, above all young males, 
and are succeeding against the odds. But the odds really are against them for a variety of reasons. And it's, it's amazing that we have sort of turned this into such a puzzle or mystery after thousands of years of how children have been raised. But on average, children do better with their mother and their father. If you want to look at it purely from an economic point of view, which I think is the least relevant, uh, children raised in single parent households are five times more likely to be poor than children raised with two married parents. Uh, and that's because you have the double earning power. But it, the, the economics of it are the least relevant as far as I'm concerned. You have two sets of kin. You have somebody when the child has been throwing a tantrum for the last three hours, uh, another parent that can provide relief. You have complementary, on average, parenting styles between mothers and fathers. Again, it's not to say that there are not instances where it is the mother that is the disciplinarian that tells the, the child to suck it up and, you know, get over it and just go on. And, and it's the father who is much more uh, sympathetic and, and uh, compassionate or, or vulnerable to the, you know, the feeling the child's pain. But on average, males and females are different. They're different psychologically. They're different biologically. This is, again, we're speaking averages. Uh, and children do best with both their parents. And what you find is not only on an individual basis, but when you have a culture where marriage has disappeared as the norm, as I said earlier, boys are not raised with a particular cultural script which says you don't go around serially impregnating girls. You wait, ideally, uh, until you're ready to get married or to be a, uh, a breadwinner. And without that expectation, what you have now in many inner city neighborhoods is something which social science rather awkwardly calls multi-partner fertility, where any given female has children by several different males, and every given male has children by several different females. That is a chaotic situation for children, even if those fathers wanted to or tried to somehow provide absentee father child support for their many children, it becomes incredibly complicated and traumatic for children. I, I write about in my book uh, some of these young crack dealers who themselves are acutely aware of the fact that they needed their fathers. Uh, they, they have a scale of paternal involvement. One, one boy that I write about says that he's come out of it pretty well because he's only a crack dealer because his father came around every so often uh, when he was a child, whereas his brother, who the mother refers to with pride as a stone cold gangster, and who specializes in armed robbery, uh, his father never showed up. And so the, the young crack dealer attributes this to the fact that he, the crack dealer, did have an occasional father in his life, whereas his younger brother, Reggie, uh, was raised exclusively by the crack uh, addicted mother. There's, that's a, so much to unpack, um, Heather, that's really interesting. And I, th I think so many that are tuning in will just light up with realization that it makes complete sense. Not only is someone, uh, a, a young child going to be more inclined, um, especially involved in crime to not care so much about breadwinning and caring about building a career um, and caring about going out and about 
to f go into a relationship with one person and have children with one person, but that creates a hugely chaotic situation for both men and women, um, getting impregnated at young ages with multiple partners, all that kind of stuff. And then furthermore, like you said, for the, the stress levels for one partner to be able to handle raising a child through their tantrums and through all of the ups and downs is crazy compared to two. Um, it's just a less stressful uh, experience, uh, more harmonious, more people get to some more sleep, um, things like that. So um, this is really interesting. And so then this sort of um, um, the, the racial like inequalities between um, this, what have you learned in that field? And then we'll kind of get into like the mismatch effect as well after that. But yeah, why don't you tell us about that? Well, let's Let's give some historical perspective here. In 1965, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, when he was at that point working for Lyndon Johnson, and they were working on civil rights remedies and trying to figure out a way to alleviate inner city poverty. When Moynihan was in the Labor Department, he did a study uh, that of, of inner city life that said that the fact that the black family was breaking down to the extent it was, was going to put a roadblock in the achievement of future racial equality. He warned against what happens to communities when marriage goes away. At that point, what Daniel Patrick Moynihan viewed as a catastrophic level of out of wedlock child rearing in the black community was a 23 percent rate of black children being born to single mothers the white rate at that point was in the low single digits today nationally the rate of black children born to single mothers is 71 percent three times what moynihan viewed as a cataclysmic social situation and if you go to certain dense inner city neighborhoods like Milwaukee uh, or Mott Haven in the Bronx, west side, south side of Chicago, you're going to find out of wedlock birth rates of closer to 80 and 85 percent. The white rate at this point is about 26 percent. Nationally, we're reaching a, a, a way over 40 percent when you average everybody in. Uh, it's extremely worrisome. And unless this gets turned around, I think that again, as Moynihan said, we are cannot possibly expect to have racial equality. There's no amount of government social service programs and no amount of government checks that can compensate for the lack of a daily presence of a father in a child's home. And again, you know, I know all of the objections. Of course, if, if a father is violent and is abusing a mother, uh, divorce is, is a better situation than a child having to witness the trauma of, of uh, that sort of sexual abuse and, and domestic violence. But those are outlying situations. What we have lost today is the ability to say that on average, fathers and mothers are equally important. And that's because feminism has taught us to believe that strong women can do it all. And men are being systemically marginalized uh, in our culture today, demeaned, you know, viewed as the source of white males in particular, the source of all evil in the world, uh, and so it becomes very hard uh, to rehabilitate fathers in that sort of environment. I cannot begin to wrap my mind. Is, is, is really 40% of all children are born out of, into a single parent? Uh, well, not born, but are being raised in a single parent household? Nationally, yes. And it's the, the white out of wedlock birth rate is going up in the uh, lower class, working class environments. That was the topic of Charles Murray's recent book, Coming Apart, 
where he looked at these white working class communities that are ravaged by drugs and they are starting to adopt the lifestyle of the uh, urban inner city as far as single parenting, teen pregnancy, and lack of work attachment. What is your, what has been your, your gut and your analysis of how people can take on more responsibility for their actions? What is it? Is, is the root um, sh bringing the community more closer together through um, early education about these types of things um, and, 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 uh, psych and psych psychology counseling? What do we really need to do to get this back to the, the drop from you know 70% in, 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 in black um, single parent being raising a children and 40% nationwide? How do we get those numbers um, down and build better communities? What do you think about that personal responsibility side of things? Well, I think it's primarily a rhetorical issue. It's an ideological issue. Uh, nobody, we are very reluctant as a culture now to stigmatize anybody. And there's a uh, understandable reason for that because we now believe in individual freedom. We're, we're reluctant to the phrase that developed in the 1960s, blame the victim. We can see in the past that there were instances perhaps of, of societies being cruel uh, to people that did not conform. Nevertheless, we used to have a norm uh, that said that people that are having children out of wedlock are making very poor moral choices. And those females were frankly stigmatized. And today, the only stigma that the culture, the elite culture is, is willing to put on is, is say on, especially on white males for simply by virtue of being a white male, uh, which is now said to carry with it an entire baggage of oppression. Uh, but I would say, even if we're not willing to stigmatize single mothers again, which is, Again, in an individual instance, stigma can be, seem cruel, and, and 19th century literature is filled with stories of, you know, the cruel, petty uh, local village driving out uh, wayward women, say. And again, we're not going to go back to that, nor should we. But we have to be able to recognize that there are better and worse environments for raising children. And I would like to see a campaign to valorize fathers. Uh, I am sick of the constant, you go girls, you know, strong women can do it all rhetoric. We have a culture now that is obsessively focused on trying to do female uplift, when in fact, as is well known by now, Females are the vast majority of college students. They're graduating at higher rates. And yet you still have these massive liberal foundations like Rockefeller and Ford pumping out one female exclusive, girl exclusive program after another to try and get more Latinas in the STEM field, say, because nobody wants to talk about boys or males because they're basically persona non grata. So I don't think that there's social programs uh, that can solve this thing. I think it takes a mindset change to be willing to once again valorize males. Yeah, it's that you're nailing it right there. It's important to bring back some sort of conversation amongst all of us about uh, getting the stigma out of male development and male um, involvement with uh, bettering uh, the collective and not, not being stigmatized as someone that's just greedy and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I'm really happy you bring that up. That, that leads us right into um, talking about the admissions and what, you, what you've been um, studying with the mismatch effect. Can you teach us about that? 
Well, the mismatch effect is uh, a concept that was first brought into kind of scholarly attention by a UCLA law professor named Richard Sander. And it holds that uh, preferences, whether it's gender preferences or racial preferences, but he's looked primarily at racial preferences because they're so ubiquitous. Uh, when you're talking about academic environments, giving somebody a racial preference does not do that person any favor because you're you're catapulting the so-called beneficiaries of preferences into academic environments where they're less competitive with their peers. And as a result, they have a hard time keeping up and they don't learn as much in classrooms. If I were admitted to MIT, say, and let's say I had 650 on my math SATs, but MIT had decided that, gee, we need more females in STEM. It must we, if we don't have females in STEM, it must be because we're somehow discriminating against all those great female applicants that we're getting and not admitting. So if they admitted me with a 650 math SAT when all of my peers were scoring 800 or close to 800, I would have an almost impossible time keeping up in my freshman year calculus or advanced calculus class because the teaching would be pitched to the average student in my class which is not me it would be the students who have mastered probably advanced calculus or further math degree uh, fields and i would be left behind and as a result i would learn less and i would likely drop out of a STEM major and transfer into a less rigorous social science or humanities field. And that's what we see with the benefic so-called beneficiaries of racial preferences. There was an interesting study that was done at Duke University that found that black male students actually entered Duke with a desire to major in STEM the science, technology, engineering, and, and math fields that is higher than white males. But their attrition rate from the STEM fields is enormous. And by the time any given class graduates, there are very few black males left in the sciences. And it's those sciences are dominated by white males and Asian males. Now, if those same black students, and, and the reason is because the black students have been admitted with SAT scores that are well over one standard deviation below what the norm is for that school. If those students who'd been admitted with racial preferences to Duke instead went to say North Carolina uh, University, and were in classes where they matched their fellow classmates in their academic preparation level, they would most likely persist in a science degree uh, and graduate with it. So racial preferences, and, and what's amazing is the refusal of colleges who inevitably have implemented massive racial preferences. The incoming academic achievement gap has been 200 points on the 1600 point SAT uh, scale now for decades. Again, it, it varies from, it, it's about a standard deviation in, in academic qualifications, but the schools refuse to be transparent about the data. Uh, I've written about this today in the Wall Street Journal uh, a case of a, a law professor there, Amy Wax, who has uh, spoken about the mismatch effect on a blogging heads video with Glenn Lowry and spoke frankly about the fact that at Penn, as at other law schools, all of whom any, any elite law school in the country or selective law school in the country practices massive racial preferences, uh, the black students end up at the rock bottom of their classes. Uh, and again, it's because they have been put into 
environments for which they are less able to compete. It is not fair to them. And it also ends up reinforcing whatever stereotypes people might have about uh, different academic abilities. <clears throat> that seems like uh, meritocracy that's not actually meritocracy. And it seems like a very bad social experiment to run to see what would happen if you threw a 650 math score SAT with an 800. Um, but I must ask this question. What if we throw someone with a 780 in with the 800s and they are from Kenya or Laos or Nigeria and they're able to provide a very different, more creative aspect to the math uh, and the engineers around them. Um, is that a potential possibility? Could that be something um, beneficial? Could that be a good part of this experiment to run? Well, that's a red herring. You know, that's always sort of the hope that it's just a mere thumb on the scale and that you have people that it's an affirmative action as tiebreaker idea that, well, if you, let's say, imagine two equally qualified, a white student, a black student, who are you going to admit? Uh, in that case, you're not harming the, if you, if you want to choose a black student, that's fine with me. But we are not talking about a 780 and an 800. We are talking again about massive differences. There's very few schools. And, and what you have is a cascading effect. Harvard can vacuum up uh, every black student that is remotely within the average of the white and Asian scores. It gets them all. And the next tier down has to dip deeper into the pool of black applicants in order to pursue its completely, I think, irrelevant uh, goal of diversity. I would completely disagree with you that there is a Nigerian way of doing math or chemistry. Uh, that's ridiculous. The only thing that matters is your ability to, to succeed in the current climate, college environment that you're in. As Amy Wax said in her now highly controversial video with Glenn Lowry, no one is saying that any given racial group should not go to college. If, if somebody is, is adequately prepared for a college career, of course, go to college, but go to college with somebody that you're prepared for. The idea that racial skin color diversity provides something uh, that is significant in scholarly pursuits I simply disagree. And, and we've produced now this perverse situation where one of the frequent complaints you hear from black students, whether it's say in a college class or a law school, when they're discussing constitutional history, say, or constitutional law, the black student will complain, well, there we are discussing the 14th Amendment and everybody looks to me for my opinion, you know, and, and the student is insulted by that. But that is precisely the rationale of diversity, that somehow by being black, you have some special insight to these matters. Well, you can't have it both ways. You quick, can't. Heather, Heather, quick yeah. question. So, so maybe you're, you know, you're totally right about, you know, calculus and chemistry. That's, you know, that's definitely some objective science, and that that makes total sense. Um, in terms of maybe like spirituality, and in terms of maybe culture, um, relationship with family, and relationship with community. You know, we're talking about that. For looping all the way back to the beginning of our conversation um, with what's going on uh, with 40% of, of children being raised uh, by only one child, a parent in the United States, isn't that also potentially something that we could learn from a different part of the world is maybe how to uh, be more a part of the community. Maybe that person that is coming in from across the world can bring that sort of diversity of thought um, to the table that could potentially be something insightful do you agree well if you're coming from across the world that's a different issue i don't know if you're saying that children of single parents um but yeah all else being equal you can strive for 
diversity of experience or family background or culture, by all means. And colleges give themselves enormous airs about their highly creative and artistic uh, efforts to assemble these somehow works of art classes. I, I think it's rather phony uh, because they pay fanatical attention to SAT scores to the point oh 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 one percent when they're deciding among whites and Asians and then suddenly declare that they're irrelevant when it comes to underrepresented minorities. But fine, if you want to focus on either skin color or gonads uh, in assembling your class, by all means do so. But the thing that has to come first is whether you're bringing in students that are prepared to compete. Because if you don't, uh, you are subjecting them to psychological stress. You know, a lot of these protests that we've been hearing from the last several years on campuses, the Black Lives Matter protests, when you have things like Princeton, black Princeton students claiming to be oppressed on campus, which is absurd. They're the most privileged individuals in human history. But part of that sense of being racially oppressed in an environment that is tolerant and compassionate and open-minded is because precisely of mismatch. That if you find yourself struggling to compete, you can either explain that by virtue of the fact that uh, you were not adequately prepared, or you can say, I must be experiencing institutional racism. Uh, now, even now, is, is, now, quickly, is, uh, you, you're totally right. You, they need to be able to compete at the really high levels, and we'd be subjecting people to a lot of psychological stress if they're unable to do so. Um, you mentioned that this is something that I just I feel like people will want to know um, the reason why you said this. Um, how exactly are uh, the people behind Black Lives Matter, are they the most privileged um, people? What I said was that any college student today is among the most privileged individuals in human history. Uh, I, I do not buy the idea that we hear from any college, any college student today. Yeah. Any college. Oh, okay. Student. Any college student today. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, it definitely. I mean, so much ubiquity in water and food and electricity and all this great stuff, their education that's being um, delivered to them with technology and everything. So maybe let's let's chat about this new book, new book coming out, Diversity Delusion, coming out in the fall. Um, give us a little taste as much as you can. Well, it continues to a certain extent what we've just been talking about. Uh, colleges have now been taken over by a single idea, which is diversity. It, it determines the curriculum. It, 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 you cannot have a college administrator open his mouth without, within, say, five seconds, uh, the word diversity coming out. Uh, there are massive campus bureaucracies dedicated to the phantom, the, the, the preposterous delusional idea that college campuses today are rife with racism. So you have vice chancellors of equity, diversity, and inclusion being created right and left. Uh, the vice chancellor of equity, diversity, and inclusion at the University of California, LA, at UCLA, is pulling in $444,000 a year. Uh, that's just a tip of the diversity iceberg at any given college. This at a time when colleges are, of course, claiming penury, uh, possibly raising tuition, uh, and I think that this is a, a complete sideshow. The, the focus of college should be on learning, but teaching students of an ever number growing group of alleged victim groups to think of themselves as victims does them no favor. To, to spell out the privileges to be on college campuses today, you have at your fingertips the thing that Faust sold his soul for, which is knowledge. You can get access to every single book that has ever been written, whether it's through technology or your own college library. You have scientific laboratories available. You can learn languages. You can study history. You can wallow in beauty, whether it's Tiepolo or Aeschylus or Shakespeare or Wordsworth or, or Jane Austen. 
all of that is available to you. You are surrounded by well-meaning adults who want the best for all of their students. And yet you have these amazing campus protests encouraged by the diversity bureaucracy where students are things like at Brown University, they're, they're, they're storming into the provost's off, provost office and saying, please exempt us from traditional college expectations like going to class or studying or doing well on our exams because as students of color at Brown, we have to work so hard at staying alive on this campus. This is a delusion. <laughs> no Brown student of any racial or ethnic group is at risk of his life from circumambient racism. And yet the diversity bureaucracy is a enthusiastic audience to that sort of delusional tantrum and encourages it in students and they are bringing that mentality with them into the world at large. That is so fascinating, the diversity delusion, the diversity bureaucracy, and it's affecting so many, if not all, Western college campuses. Is it been, it's become pretty much all now. Yes, you can't find, it's, it's not something uh, confined to say the Ivy Leagues, it's not confined to small private schools, it's in community colleges, it's in large state schools, it's in small state schools. Uh, the humanities have largely been wrecked by the expectation uh, that arose in the 1980s that as a college student, you should not be expected to read the alleged the Western canon. Uh, you, you had the growth of this ridiculously ignorant phrase of dead white males. Students are being taught to feel contempt for the greatest works of Western civilization on the basis of the skin color and gonads of their authors, something that is completely irrelevant. Students are rejecting these works with the encouragement of their professors, having never read them. Uh, but it is this victimology that is leading to the assaults on free speech that we've seen take over campuses uh, over the last couple of years, uh, because students, again, claim that they are being victimized uh, so much on campus and that non-Orthodox political views that reject this racial victimology puts them at lethal risk that anything that is non-Orthodox is a form of hate speech and that therefore uh, they have a right to silence it with violence if necessary. And this is exactly where I wanted to lead into just free speech, the idea that the diversity bureaucracy is making it difficult for people to critique the diversity bureaucracy um, with the rioting and the protesting. Um, the, we are so privileged to live in today's time with the resources that we have um, and to ride and protest to such an extent where we can't have an equanimous conversation with the other person across the table about our ideas and about um, where we should build a future towards is that's very unsettling for me because we really need to be able to have civilized discourse about where we should go in the future. Um, th th looking forward to um, the diversity delusion, um, w maybe uh, any last thoughts, Heather, on, on kind of w how we can have more of this civilized discourse? What are these steps that we have to take in order to be able to get back at that? Well, the predominant strategy so far has been to issue rousing peons to free speech and reason discourse. And that is, of course, important uh, because you have two alternatives. You can have discourse and, and civil argumentation, or you have force and violence. The idea of resolving disagreement and uh, conflict through persuasion and rhetoric is one of the great advances of our civilization. And it is, it is not trivial to see 
the increasing normalization and indeed celebration of the use of force to shut down opposing viewpoints. After the February uh, riots against Milo Yiannopoulos last year in Berkeley, there were two Berkeley professors who sent out emails to their fellow faculty, basically uh, congratulating the Antifa thugs for shutting down the Milo talk. So you have, this is being normalized now, but I would argue that however important it is to try and educate people about the massive advance and importance of civil discourse, college presidents can come out with every you know, petition they want or, or statement of principles, and very few of them are doing so. But even if everyone would, it wouldn't matter as long as we have this ideology of victimhood uh, that is being so relentlessly promoted by colleges because it is that ultimately which is driving the assaults on free speech. And it, as long as people are being brainwashed into thinking themselves as victims when they are occupying the most well-endowed Pacific environments in human history, you're going to continue to see these demands to shut down speech. Yes, exactly. Um, v v persuasion and rhetoric is such an advancement of human cognitive ability, and it's one of the main foundations of s advancing civilization, um, this equanimous rhetoric and persuasion. Um, and victimhood has definitely become the main uh, sort of essence of wanting to uh, proclaim that, oh, something so wrong, it's so wrong, rather than picking up part of the world on your back and going out forth and trying to make things better um, in some way, making some value into the world and, um, you know, and all that good stuff that has kind of been discussed by you and a lot of people on the intellectual dark web. It's very interesting. Um, Heather, maybe a quick question for you about, let's maybe mention the cosmos. Um, do you think that we're alone in the cosmos, Heather? Well, I don't know about alien forms of life. Uh, I would say probably given the age of the cosmos and its massive size and the uh, result of, of constant evolution change that it would be unusual if we were the only life form in the universe. And Heather, what do you think is the purpose of life? To make human meaning. Uh, I am, I think to try to strive to express yourself, um, to help others to a certain extent, but to try to contribute what you can uh, to your own advancement and to that of others. I would say it should also be a, a gratitude for the extraordinary scientific, technological advances and artistic wealth uh, that is at our fingertips today. Yeah, make the best meaning we can for ourselves, for others, and be grateful for the world that a hundred plus billion people have built this beautiful world we live in today. So, Heather McDonald, what an absolute pleasure. Um, I'm so grateful that we're able to make the Skype happen from New York. Um, we're gonna we'll put links in the bottom for The War on Cops, your, um, your book, as well as um, your upcoming book, um, Diversity Delusion, hopefully released in the fall. Um, you have an op-ed that you just wrote, so we'll put a link down there in the, um, the footer as well, in the bio. Um, I, re I really hope to have you in San Francisco soon. Stop by the studio. We'll do some more uh, great conversation. Uh, and thank you so much, Heather. Thank you so much, Alex. Yes, we can talk about your ongoing problem which San Francisco never seems to be able to solve. But anyway, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Isn't it great? We still have some people in San Francisco at least 
having the civilized discourse with both sides. We got to have that. And even in the Midwest of the US, where it's potentially very conservative, it's important to be able to have discourse across the table. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll talk more soon. See ya.